Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for For the Love of Crafting, five Valentine's Day Creations from the Heart mini series. My name is Leah, and I am your moderator for today's event. Craftsy, the Knitting Circle, the National Sewing Circle, and the National Quilter Circle have all teamed up to provide a full week of live demonstrations and a bundle of Valentine's Day inspired patterns and recipes. You can make sure to download those free patterns and recipes by clicking the link in the description where you'll get all of the information that you need to get a hand on those recipes and patterns. Every day this week, a new instructor is going to be streaming live as we quilt, sew, knit, and bake. You will get step-by-step -step demonstrations of all of the cute projects that are perfect for gifting to your loved ones this Valentine's Day. Of course, if you have any questions during the event, please leave your comments in the blue chat box below or in the chat on Facebook and YouTube. If you wanna practice that right now, you can go ahead and say hi, let us know where you are joining us from. We love to see just how wide our community of viewers is and everybody's really collaborative in that chat box as well. So once again, go ahead and drop a hello in right away if you would like to practice using that chat box. And I'm going to have my eye on it the entire event if there are questions that come in that are something that we are working on right at the moment, I always like to slide those in so we can address them when they're appropriate. And then more general questions, if we've got time at the end of the project, I like to get as many of those in as well. So fire away with all of your questions throughout today's project, which does bring us to our instructor today. We are joined by Jen Lucas. She is our knitting expert and managing editor of The Knitting Circle. Hello and welcome, Jen. I'm gonna have you start us off by telling us just a little bit about you and what we're making today. Okay, well, thanks, Leah. Yeah, I'm Jen Lucas, managing editor of The Knit Knitting Circle. I am a knit and crochet designer. I'm located in the suburbs of Chicago, and I love designing all kinds of things, shawls, um, different accessories, and dishcloths like we're going to be doing today. Fantastic. Well, we have a bunch of people joining from all over. Like I said, keep your questions coming into the chat box, and I will keep an eye on it. Jen is going to get us started. I'm going to toss it right to you so we can dig into today's project. Okay, great. I'm just gonna go ahead and tilt my camera down so everybody can see my knitting. So here we go. And I'll zoom in a little bit too, there we go. Okay, so we're gonna be making this dishcloth here. And so you can see this one I just made with a smooth dishcloth cotton yarn. I also have made one out of this scrubby sort of yarn. So if um, you want more of like a scrubby to wash your dishes with, you can find this yarn at big box craft stores too. So let's start off by talking about the supplies we're gonna need. So first of all, you're gonna need that dishcloth cotton. It's gonna use about 60 yards of a worsted weight dishcloth cotton. Most of these um, balls that you can buy at the craft store or online, they typically come with at least 140 yards of yarn in the in the ball of yarn which means you can make at least two out of one ball of yarn sometimes you can even get three which is really great because these are very inexpensive and so you can make more than one so you're also going to need some knitting needles you're going to need a u.s size 7 or really even a u.s size 8 it, gauge is not super important in terms of um, how many stitches per inch we're getting with this because it's a dishcloth it doesn't have to fit anybody um, but i have a u.s size 7 here um, I'm actually gonna be knitting here in the video on circular needles, so you can use straights or circulars, um, but obviously you'll need two knitting needles to knit. Um, the next thing we're gonna need is just some scissors to finish up our project, and then also a tapestry needle, which has a blunt end, so we can weave in our ends at the end of the project. And then there's a couple of optional supplies. So you might wanna grab a stitch marker. I like these locking stitch markers. They kind of look like a little coilless safety pin. Um, and that's just to mark this one side of your dishcloth because we're gonna be working the dishcloth in garter stitch, which means the front and the back look basically the same. So having that stitch marker might be helpful just so you can keep track of which side's the right side and the wrong side as you're following the instructions. And then the other thing that's optional is a stitch holder. So when we're working the top of the heart, we're gonna work from the bottom up and then we're gonna separate so we can finish 
the little top halves here. And so this is not absolutely necessary to have, but if you want, you can have one of these so you can put the stitches on the one side on the stitch holder here as we're finishing up this side. But we'll get to that as I'm explaining how to knit it. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first step is that we just need to cast on two stitches. And so I'm gonna do that by first making a slip knot. And so I'm just going to fold my yarn over and then fold it over the tail and bring the needle through to make my slip knot. I'm leaving, I don't know, a six to eight inch tail so I can weave that in at the end. And then we just need to cast on one more stitch because the slip knot counts as our first stitch. Now, it really does not matter what cast on you use. I'm gonna use the long tail cast on, you could use the knitted cast on, any cast on you want. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring my yarn like this to do my long tail cast on and just cast on one more stitch. So I have two stitches on the needle. So the next thing we're gonna do is turn it around so that the yarn or the working needle, the free needle is in my right hand and then the stitches that are on the needle, that needle's in my left hand. And now we're gonna work some setup rows. And one thing I just wanna point out quickly as I'm starting is that I knit using the English or throwing method. So I have the yarn in my right hand. Now, if you use the continental method, you will have the yarn in your left hand and it does not matter. You're still doing the same stitches. We're basically just doing knit stitches, a few slip stitches, and a little bit of increasing and decreasing. So it doesn't matter which hand you have your yarn in. Um, just knit however you normally knit. So for the first setup row, we're going to slip one with the yarn in the front. And the reason I'm gonna do that, if I just bring this back in here quickly, my, my dishcloth, is that I think it looks really nice to have this edge along the side of our dishcloth. It just kind of gives it a nice smooth edge that kind of finishes off that heart shape. So we're gonna be slipping the first stitch on every row. So we're gonna slip one with yarn in front. So I'm going to slip that stitch purl wise. So I'm inserting my needle like this and you can see my yarn here's in the front. I'm slipping with the yarn in the front. And then the next stitch I'm going to knit into the front and back. So I've brought the yarn to the back because I'm gonna be knitting. And then I'm going to knit into the front of the stitch, bring that needle around and knit into the back of that stitch. And so I've increased by one stitch. And so I had two and now I have three. And then to work the next setup row, we're going to slip one with yarn in front again. We're gonna be doing that for the whole entire dishcloth. So slip one with yarn in front, bring to the back, knit into the front and back of the next stitch. So we had two, one stitch and now we have two, and then we're gonna knit one. So we had three stitches and now we have four. Now we are coming to row three, and this row we're just gonna keep repeating for a while to increase for our dishcloth. What we're gonna do is slip one with yarn in front, knit to the last two stitches, which on this first row, we only have to knit one and then we're already at our two stitches. Knit front and back. Knit, so we did our knit front and back and now we're gonna knit one. So now we have five stitches. So every row now in the increase section of our dishcloth, we're gonna be adding one stitch. So I'll do a couple more of these rows for you. We're gonna slip one with yarn in front, bring the yarn to the back to knit. We're gonna knit to the last two stitches on our needle. So now I have two stitches left here. Knit front and back. knit one and we're going to just keep repeating that i'll do one more for you here we're going to slip one with yarn in front bring the yarn to the back knit to the last two stitches knit front and back so that's doing that increase and then knit one and so from there, we're just gonna keep repeating that row until we get to 40 stitches total. So bringing my dishcloth back in here. So we started down here, 
and now we're working up and we're basically going to keep increasing until we get to this very wide part of our heart here. So you would just keep repeating that row three over and over and over again until you get to your 40 stitches here. So once you have that done, and I've made a swatch here. I didn't quite get to, I didn't quite go all the way up to 40, so you don't have to watch me knit across long rows, but you'll have something that looks like this. There'll be a total of 40 stitches. Now we're gonna go ahead and work the straight section. So we're just gonna work a few rows plain. I'll go ahead and work one of those for you. And so what we're gonna do on those rows is we're gonna slip one with yarn in the front, bring it to the back, and then I'm just gonna simply knit all the way across to the end. And so Leah, I'm not sure if there's any questions at this point as I'm knitting across my row here. Okay, so there's a there's a couple things to think about here is that so some people that are left-handed, they knit the same way I do. They just have the yarn in their left hand. And so you would be following these same instructions. And actually, if you're a true left-handed knitter in that you knit in the mirror image of what I'm doing, this pattern is exactly the same because it's looks the same on both the right side and the wrong side. So following these instructions, if you're a true left-handed knitter and you knit in the mirror image of the way that, for example, I'm knitting here, you'll still have the exact same heart dishcloth when you're done. Okay, this is a question that I get a lot on the knitting circle too. And so really when you're starting a new ball of yarn or even changing colors to a different ball of yarn that's a different color, you just simply drop the old yarn and pick up the new yarn and start knitting with it. And now when you do that, it can look a little bit loose at first because you have these tails sort of hanging off. However, um, there's a couple things you can do. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll just tie a very loose knot to tie the two yarns together, um, but I don't like to leave knots in my knitting in general. So I might leave a loose knot there while I'm working my project. And then when I'm done, I'll take that little knot out to weave in my ends. The other thing I like to do, and I don't know, maybe it's just because sometimes I like sort of the quick or lazy way of doing things with my knitting. I actually will take the two yarns, my old yarn and my new yarn, and I will knit one or two stitches of my project with both of the yarns held together. And I like to do this at the beginning of a row because it's easier to sort of hide the fact that you use two yarns instead of one sort of on the edge of your project. Um, the only thing if you do that, I think it does look pretty neat as well. You just want to make sure that when you're coming back to those stitches on the next row, you don't accidentally knit them as two se separate stitches. You want to treat them as one stitch where you held the yarn together, because if you knit them separately, you're going to change your stitch count. Um, you can also do something um, that's called a magic knot. We do have a video for that um, on the knitting circle that you sort of do this very tight, secure knot um, that makes an almost, um, invisible knot in your, in your knitting. Um, but I, I personally don't use that one very often. I usually just knit the two yarns, um, together for a stitch or two, um, just to kind of secure them in place. Uh, and we do have a question here too, from a guest that is knitting along oh. and we have a request to be a little more specific about the slip stitch part. They're feeling a okay. little lost already. Would you be able to back up and show us a slip stitch? Yes, so the slip stitch, we're doing that at the beginning of every row on this project. Again, just cause you get sort of this nice, you get this nice, almost like braid looking, nice chain of stitches here. And so for this particular project, I'm slipping one stitch with yarn in front. 
I'm slipping that stitch purl wise. In general, in knitting, you always want to slip a stitch purl wise unless a pattern tells you not to. And so we have we want the yarn in the front. So I'm going to bring this needle back here. So I have my working yarns in the front. I'm going to slip it purl wise. So I'm slipping it as if I was going to purl, okay? Because if I was going to knit, I would be going into my stitch this way. And so if I slipped it off, that would be slipping as if to knit. But to slip as if to purl, if I was gonna purl, I would be going into the stitch this way and then wrapping my yarn around to purl. So we wanna slip the stitch this way because then it does not twist the stitch. And then again, I'm leaving the yarn in the front just because I like the detail that it ends, that it adds to the edge of my, um, edge of my dishcloth. So then I just slip it here. Let me go back one more time. So then I'm going to just slip it purl wise, just like that. And then my yarn's still in the front because I was slipping with the yarn in the front. I'm going to take this yarn, move it in between the needles to the back to then start working the next part of my dishcloth, which is knitting. We actually also have a free video on this um, on the knitting circle. Um, which both explain, we have two videos, one that explains slip as if to purl and slip as if to knit. And then we also have another video that goes into a little more detail that explains with yarn in front versus with yarn in back. So in addition to, you can always come back and reference this video um, that you're watching right now, but you could also go to the knitting circle and find those videos as well. Great, and I'm gonna give you one more question before I'll let you take it away and continue on with your demo. Uh, a few people are curious, uh, they've noticed that you have a stitch marker on your sample and wondering why that's placed, where it's placed, what you're using that for. Okay, that's a great question because I forgot to actually mention it. So, um, so when I was working the increases of my dishcloth here, let me bring let me bring this one back in. So when I was working the increases, I don't honest personally worry too much about which side's the right side or the wrong side, as I know that I'm just gonna keep repeating that row three until I get to 40 stitches. But once I get up to those 40 stitches, I find like sometimes it can be a little hard to remember exactly my place or remember what side, if I'm on the right side or wrong side, since both sides look the same. So what I did for this particular dishcloth was after I worked my increase rows, and I'll take this off and then show you here. Actually, let me just back this knitting out a bit so we can actually see here what I'm doing. So I like to add the stitch marker when I'm starting the straight section. So the straight section, we're working six rows of slipping that first stitch with yarn in front and then knitting across. And so what I've done is this was the end of my increase section. I take my locking stitch marker and I just run it through one of the stitches and clip it to the front. So now I know that this is the front of my dishcloth. And now when I'm working those straight, the straight section, I was, when I was knitting these for, you know, to get ready for this video, I, the first one I made, I kind of was losing my place. By marking this here now, I can just count my garter stitch bumps. And so what do I mean by garter stitch bumps? So garter stitch is this fabric we've created here. And you can see these like lines of these bumps. They're called Pearl Ridge, Garter Ridge, Garter Bumps. They have different names. But two rows of knitting make one line of these bumps. And so now I know I've put this one here. Now I'm working six rows of the straight section. So that means that I'll have three um, garter sort of ridges here to equal my six rows because two rows will make one of those ridges. And so that's why it's nice. It's not absolutely necessary that you have the stitch marker, but it is nice to have because now if I, you know, set this down, go do something else and then come back, I know, okay, I've already worked two rows of my straight section. I need to do four more. So that's the reason that I use the stitch marker. Again, not absolutely necessary. Okay, and I did lie. We just got a question that I want to make sure we get to here while we're talking about mm -hmm. stitch counting. Um, oh, question three, stitch count. Do you increase to 40 or 42? Row counts to decrease to 36 don't match if it's only 40. 
Um, okay, so we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to increase to 40 and then we're going to start decreasing by two stitches um, in the next section, which is what I'm going to get to now. So we're going to keep, and I don't, and I also, I don't know if this also is confusing. I did not put a full 40 stitches on my swatch here, just so you didn't have to watch me knit 40 stitches back and forth. So we're going to keep increasing to 40 stitches. Then we're going to knit six rows where we're slipping that first stitch and knitting. And then we're going to start our decreases. So let me just bring that in here. And as a reminder for our viewers, if you're just joining us, we'll get to some more general questions uh, at the end of the project. So if you are hanging on to a question that you want to see answered, don't worry. I do see some of those more general questions as well. I'll give them to Jen as we get towards the tail end of our event today. Yes, great. Okay, so now on this particular one here, I have my six rows of straight just doing the knitting where I've only slipped that first stitch. So you can see here, here's my marker. Then I have one, two, three garter ridges. And so I know I've done my six rows. And now we're going to go ahead and start our decreases. And so to do the decreases, we're going to slip one with yarn in front, slipping it pearlwise, just like we have been. Now we're going to do a slip, slip knit. So we're going to slip as if to knit, slip as if to knit and then bring our left needle through so we can knit those two together through the back loops, just like that. And so that's making a left leaning decrease. And then we're going to knit all the way until there's three stitches left, and then we'll do another decrease. So we're just gonna keep working along here. So now we're just starting to form the top of the heart sort of getting ready to um, separate our stitches uh, to do those the top halves of the heart. So I'm just gonna keep working across here. And once I have my three stitches left, we will knit two together. So here we go. So I have three stitches left, and so now I'm gonna knit two together. We're gonna knit two stitches together. So I'm simply just going into the next two stitches as if to knit, but I'm doing them together. Knitting them together. So I've taken two stitches and made one and then knit one. Then the next three rows, we're just going to um, keep doing what we were doing on that straight section. We're gonna slip one, knit to the end. We're doing that for three rows and then we're gonna work another decrease row so here we would have gone um, on the actual dishcloth, we would have gone from 40 stitches to 38 because we did a decrease at the beginning and the end. Um, then we're gonna do three rows just plain like we had been. Then we're gonna work another decrease row. So we had 38, we're gonna go down to 36 and then work three more stitches or three more rows just plain. And then we're gonna separate for the top of our heart. All right, so Jen, I think this is a good time to get into this next question from Evelyn. Mm -hmm. Evelyn says, I am very new to this art. So first of all, welcome. We yeah. love having people try something out for the first time. Uh, so Evelyn wants to know, what do you mean when you are saying drop a stitch? Oh, drop a stitch. Do you mean like if I, I don't know if she means like if I've dropped a stitch off the needle I believe that's what it is. I think this is a separate question from your decreasing. Ah, okay, got you. So if you drop a stitch off the needle here, I'll just I'll show you here. Actually, let me bring let me bring in the one I've already knit on. So if I mess it up, it doesn't matter. Okay, so if you've dropped a stitch, that's to say if you have, let's say you're coming over here, and maybe this stitch has fallen off the needle here, like this one right here has fallen off the needle. And sometimes it might even start to come like fully, as you can see now I'm unraveling my knitting here. And so that's when you say dropped, dropped a stitch, that means you literally, one of them fell off the needle. Um, and those can be fixed um, depending on when you find your mistake, that is something that you can correct. Um, 
most of the time they are fixable. As you can see, I just kind of brought my stitch back up like that. So when you say drop a stitch, it just means like it literally fell off the needle. And the way to fix that would be? Okay, so in this particular case, and we... We do have videos for this too on the knitting circle. Um, there are some free videos on how to fix some basic mistakes. Um, and so, for example, if you just come and it's just right here, your stitch literally just like just fell off, you just simply pick it back up. We're working in garter stitch here, and so if it has come down a few, a few uh, rows, like you've got something like, uh oh, you've got something like this. This looks bad. <laughs> like this is unraveling. You have to, and I don't have a crochet hook here with me, but if you have a crochet hook, this is actually much easier. Um, you just have to pick that stitch back up slowly, making sure you're maintaining the pattern you're in. So I can see here, if we kind of pull this, so I've grabbed the stitch that had fallen down and you can see I have these three sort of strands going across. Well, these are the previous, this is the yarn from those rows where it had dropped down. And so now you have to follow it back up, but you have to make sure that you are maintaining your garter stitch. So this yarn here goes over here to this stitch. I can see that made the garter bump. So I'm gonna have to go into that one in order to make the bump come on this side. Then the next one, the yarn goes here to where it's flat, where we sort of have what looks like a knit stitch. And so we have to bring this strand up and pass it over this way so it matches like that. And you'd have to keep repeating this process. And so I realize like we're on a, you know, a live video. This may be a little hard to see, but we do have a free video on the knitting circle that explains how to do just that. And it's like nice and close up. Um, but you just need to take your time to get your stitch back on the needle. Um, like I said, in most situations, even if you've messed up a lace or a cable pattern or something and you've dropped a stitch, you can almost, I'm not going to say always, but you can almost always fix it. Um, and so if you drop a stitch, don't worry. And if you do see that you've dropped a stitch, like here, if I'm like knitting along and I'm like, uh oh, I've dropped this. And if you're not right at the point of where you can fix it, you can always take one of these locking stitch markers and loop it through that drop stitch and just let it hang down until you, like if you had dropped it way over here or something, you can catch your drop stitch with one of these stitch markers here. And then when you get to the point that you can, you're actually on your needle where you have the space to fix it, then you can fix it. So, um, but again, drop stitches are almost always fixable. So don't worry. And it's part of learning to knit. It happens to everybody. <laughs> All right, and while Jen is pulling in her next step for the demo, just a quick reminder, I did see a question about starting knitting. Um, I would love to ask this question in general towards the end of the project, but if you are curious about this particular project and you're just joining us, there is a link in the description that will take you to the materials list and the pattern that uh, Jen has been working off of, and you can just click on that and find all the instructions that you need. And I do believe our team has dropped that link into the chat box as well, so just scroll up in the chat box for the link if you're curious. Uh, and with that, I'm going to send it right back over to Jen so we can keep on knitting our way through. Okay, great. So um, again, I just have a swatch. I have a few less stitches on my swatch than the actual dishcloth, just so it's a little bit quicker on the video. Um, but once we have finished our decreases, now we're going to separate for the top of the heart. And this is where you optionally need one of these. I will show you how to use this. Um, but especially here where I'm using um, a circular needle, you don't necessarily need one of these because you could just let the stitches that we aren't working rest on the cord. So uh, let's go ahead and work this next row. So in the instructions, you'll be slipping one purl wise with yarn in the front, just like we have been. And then we're going to bring the yarn to the back. And in the instructions, we're going to knit 17. Um, I'm going to obviously I'm going to knit just a few less here just so we're not having to watch so much knitting. And then at this point, so basically now you're going to knit to when you're at the halfway point of your heart because we had 36 stitches total. And so um, we're doing slipping. We're going to slip one knit 17. So that's 18. So that's half the number of stitches. So we're just going to keep working here until I get to the halfway point on my little swatch here. So let's see, we have, 
Okay, perfect. And so now at this point, I have half my stitches over here, half my stitches over here. At this point, we're gonna turn and we're gonna just only work on this half. And so this is what I'm, I mean by you can use one of these or not. So I could either turn this around and just start working back this way and then just have these stitches resting right here, um, which, you know, if you've made a few projects, it might be easy for you just to keep track. You're used to reading your knitting. Um, but if you're a beginner um, or you just have a hard time sometimes when you pick up your knitting, reading where you are on your fabric, then I would suggest using one of these so you don't actually accidentally, when we come back over here, accidentally knit on this second half. And so to use one of these stitch holders, it's just, it's like a giant coil of safety pin. Um, and they come in all different sizes. So I'm just slipping the stitches that I don't need. I've just opened it up and it's basically like a small knitting needle on here. And I'm just slipping these stitches on to the stitch holder. And you'll notice that I'm slipping them purl wise which means I'm slipping this way as if I would be purling, but I'm just slipping. And I'm doing that so I'm not twisting the stitches at all so that when I come back to work them, they'll be on, when I put them back on the needle, they'll be, be oriented the right way on my knitting needle. And so now I'm just slipping these on here. And again, totally optional. But now this, see, they can't, they can't come off. And so this can just rest as I'm working the rest of my dishcloth. And so now we've separated. We're on the wrong side because now I've, and this is again where having the stitch marker is helpful because now um, as we're working these decreases, we're working the decreases for the most part on the right side. So I know that because I have this marker, this is my right side. And I'm going to work one more straight row. I'm just gonna hold this up so it's not making so much noise on the table. I'm gonna slip and then knit across. So we're just simply knitting across just like we have been. And then on the next row, we're gonna start our decreases. So if we get a little more yarn here. And so now for the second half, or for this first half of this heart uh, for the top, we're just working the decreases in a very similar manner that we were already doing. We're just only doing it on half. And that is we're going to, here we go, turn it around to the right side. And you can see here, I have my stitches resting here. Now we're gonna work a decrease row. We're just gonna do the same thing we, were, we did before on our decrease rows. We're gonna slip one with yarn in front, bring the yarn to the back, slip, slip, knit, slip as if to knit, slip as if to knit, bring the needle into those two stitches and knit them through the back loop, knit to the last three stitches. And now you're knitting to the last three stitches on the top half of this heart. So this is where it's nice because we have those stitches separated. So it's real easy to tell because now we just have three stitches left on this top half of our heart. We're going to knit two together knit one and then turn it around. And so we're just gonna keep working our decreases on the wrong side rows, we're just going to be slipping and then knitting across. And then on the right side rows, we're doing the decreases we have been doing where we're slipping, slip, slip, knit, knit to the last three stitches, knit two together, knit one. It's only on the very last wrong side row, we're just gonna do one of those decrease rows on the wrong side, just to help shape the heart a little bit more. And All so right, I'm gonna interject before your next sure. step here. We do have somebody, and I'm sure you're not the only one that is worried about being able to watch this back. It will be available to watch back. So don't worry if you're not making this project until tomorrow. You can start the entire thing from the beginning. If you're doing it with us right now and you need a review, or if you're starting fresh at a different time, you will be able to rewatch this. Please do not worry. Take the tips that Jen is offering now and come back and revisit them at any time. Yeah, that's a great point. Because sometimes it is helpful if you've missed something that you can just come back and check it out again and make sure you you know where you are. Exactly. So, 
So now that we have, um, after you work the decreases, and they're all in the downloadable PDF pattern, and there's photos in there as well to help you in case like you need a close-up photo of any of the steps I'm doing. So now that we have six stitches left, now we're ready to bind off. And so to bind off, you can do whatever bind off you like. I mean, there's hundreds of bind offs in knitting. Um, a standard bind off would be just to knit one, knit a second stitch, and pass the first stitch over the second one, just like that. And you would keep repeating that. But I wanna show you what I did on my dishcloth just to make it look a little bit neater. Um, this is just sort of like an added bonus. Just as I was working it, I, I just found this was a little bit neater. So when I was binding off this row, I still slipped that first stitch as if to purl with the yarn in the front. So I'm doing that instead of knitting one for my bind off. Then I just knit the second stitch, then I pass the first one over. And so it just kind of makes another little slip stitch. It just kind of made it so it flowed into the bind off a little bit more. That's a very minor detail that you don't have to do. I mean, it is a dishcloth, you're gonna wash your dishes with it, but um, it was just something I thought looked a little bit neater. And so now I'm just binding off. So you have one stitch left on your needle. You're gonna knit one, pass the first over the second, and then again, what I like to do when I'm finishing off most projects when I'm binding off, not always, um, when I have two stitches left when I'm binding off, I actually like to knit those two together and then pull my yarn over here to bind off that last stitch. Again, minor little detail, but sometimes when you bind off, it's a little loose and loopy on the end, um, and that just makes it a little bit tighter. Again, minor detail that you do not have to do if you don't want to. Um, and so now I just have my one stitch left, and so I'm gonna take my scissors and give my yarn a cut here to finish off this first half of the heart. And so I'm just gonna pull my yarn through here, and there you go. And so we're just gonna kind of spread everything out a little bit. And so I've bound off the first half of my heart. And so now we have our stitches over here that we had held. We're gonna just work the second half of the heart. So first, obviously we need to get our knitting needle onto those stitches. So I'm just gonna open up the stitch holder. And now I'm just taking my needle and I'm slipping them back. And so you just want to make sure you're not twisting your stitches as your um, you don't want to go into them this way as you're slipping them. You just want to make sure you're going into them this way, sort of purl wise. Seems a little weird because you're kind of coming from the other direction, but you just don't want to twist your stitches as you're slipping them back to your needle. Um, so they're ready to be worked. So now we don't need this anymore. I can set that out of the way. And so our stitches are back here on the second half of our heart and we're ready to knit the second half of our heart. So first you're gonna need your yarn and you're gonna to have to reattach it. And so to reattach it, we're just gonna start knitting with it. Um, and so because we're slipping that first stitch, I still am just, what I do is I just sort of hold this in front, slip it and then move it to the back. So we're actually gonna attach it on that second stitch just to maintain that slip stitch. So now here, we're just gonna start knitting. And so you can see, here's my tail right here. I'm just knitting with the yarn. Um, and so this is to um, just reattach the yarn. We're gonna work two rows straight. And then basically then we're just working the decreases in the exact same manner that we did on the first half of the heart. Um, it's worked exactly the same because obviously you want both sides to match. Um, and so you would just keep following the pattern. So that was the right side row. The next wrong side row is again, we're just going to work one of those sort of straight rows. And by straight row, I mean, we're not increasing or decreasing at all. So we're going to slip with yarn in front, move to the back and knit. And then we're all set up after this to work those decreases in the exact same way that we did on the first half. And then you're going to bind off the same way and just weave in your ends and your dishcloth is done. Now, when you're, when you're going from right side to wrong side, we mm -hmm. have a question here coming in about that. Does it change the way that you knit or are you knitting exactly the same just on the wrong side? Yes, you're just knitting exactly the same way. So you're doing your knit stitch on the right side the same way you do it on the wrong side. 
um, you just, as you work across the row, basically what happens if you knit the way I do, um, unless you're a truly left-handed knitter and knit in the mirror image, um, when you're knitting, what happens is all the stitches start off on the needle in your left hand. They end up in the needle on the needle that's in your right hand. And so then you have to flip it around so that you can work back. But the way you do the stitches, whether you're on the right side or the wrong side, it's exactly the same. You don't have to try to like do any sort of mirror image of what you did. If, you, if it says just to knit on the wrong side, you just do a regular knit stitch. And so again, you're just gonna work those decreases the exact same way for the second half of the heart. And then all you need to do at that point is um, weave in your ends. And so I'll just show you on this swatch quickly how to do that. Your, your whole entire dishcloth would obviously be done at this point. But you just wanna take all of the ends that you have. So here's one here. We're going to put the, oops, lost it there. Hold on a second. <laughs> the joys of being live, there we go. Um, so we have the tapestry needle and we are going to put it onto our yarn tail. So anywhere that you have a yarn tail on this project, you need to do this. I like to fold the yarn tail over and then poke it through the hole. And there's different tapestry or yarn needles that have different size eyes. So this is kind of the standard one. I typically use this for you know, a worsted weight yarn. And then we're just going to weave in the ends. And so to do that, you're just gonna sort of, and I'm on the wrong side. Again, it's a dishcloth, it probably doesn't matter too much, but in general, you're gonna weave in your ends on the wrong side of your fabric. So this is the side that doesn't have the stitch marker. And I'm just bringing the yarn sort of following, I'm going under the stitches, sort of just following a line, just kind of going up and down. You just don't wanna to pull too tight, so you start sort of puckering your stitches. Um, but you do want to make sure that you do this for at least a few stitches so that your tail doesn't come completely out. Um, I mean, here we started with a slip knot. It's not like it's going to unravel your whole entire project or anything. Um, you sort of want to follow a few stitches just going up and down. Um, some people do like to split the yarn. I really only do that if the yarn's super bulky, um, but that would help secure it. Um, you could tie a knot if you wanted to. I don't like to, so I'm not going to. Um, and then I just kind of give it a pull here. And then at this point, whatever little bit of tail we have left, we're just going to trim it close to our dishcloth. Just be careful not to cut your dishcloth. And here you can see, like, you might be able to see a little bit here on the, on the wrong side where I had been weaving in my end. But when I come to the right side here, you really can't see it at all. And so you would just repeat that process for the entire dishcloth. And then your dishcloth is done and you are ready to use it or give it to a friend or whatever you wanna do with it. And again, you can do these in all sorts of different yarns. Um, like I said, you can usually get two out of one of these balls, sometimes three. Um, if you're comfortable with it, you could even, you know, do stripes, do yarn that looks like this for two rows, then this for two rows. Um, you know, again, I use this scrubby yarn here. There's lots of options with this one, but so cute. All right, we do have some general questions if you're ready to take them. Yeah, let me just tilt this back up here so I can see everybody. Okay, there we go. Perfect, hello. Hello, <laughs> hello again. All right, I'm gonna try to start small. We have some general questions that came in about this specific project, and then we'll expand. We have some really general questions that are gonna be great, especially for some of our beginners out there. Awesome. Uh, so the first question that we have, uh, we had somebody asking specifically if they could use this as their first knitting project. I absolutely think that this would be a great first knitting project. I think it, this project gives you a little bit of everything um, because you are just practicing that knit stitch, which is the first stitch you learn when you learn to knit. Um, and you are doing some very basic increases and decreases. There's nothing really in here that I think is so hard that you know a, a brand new knitter can do it. And when I was deciding on what project to do sort of for this series for this week, I really did try to keep it with the beginner in mind. Um, and another bonus is you have this video to come back to and the photos that are in the uh, PDF download as well. So yeah, great beginner project. Um, because I always with new knitters, 
Um, I think the tendency is to want to maybe knit a scarf, right? That's what we all think of when like, oh, I'm going to knit, I'm going to knit a scarf. Um, but the reality of it is for most people that you're, you're all excited about your scarf and about 12 inches into it, you've sort of mastered your knit stitch and now you're super bored. And um, like the one example I always use is um, I was teaching my niece to knit and she was going to make a scarf and then her scarf turned into, I don't, it turned into like a blanket for her doll. And then it like literally turned into like a scarf for her Barbie. I mean, so, you know, it's just like over time, as you like learn the stitch, then you become bored with it. So I think that this is a great first project because it's very small. I mean, you know, I've been knitting a long time, so it did not take me very long to knit this at all. But even if you're a beginner, just a few hours, maybe, and you would have, if that, you would have this done. It's really a really quick project. I think it'd be a great beginner project. Sure. All right. Thanks for sending that question in, Tessa. I'm sure you were not the only one wondering mm -hmm. that. Uh, we're going to move into the yarn for this project mm -hmm. here. This is a question coming in from Carol. Uh, the yarns used area lists the sugar and cream yarn and the scrubby yarn. Does mm -hmm. this mean you can use one or the other, or can you use both yarns together? Um, that's a great question. So the yarns that are listed in the PDF download, those are the yarns that I used for the photos. So the Sugar and cream yarns, those are the pinks that I used. I used them separately. Um, and then I did use the scrubby yarn separately. You absolutely could hold the two together. You are going to need a larger knitting needle um, because I, especially the scrubby yarn um, held together um, with the other cotton yarn, your stitches are gonna get really tight if you're trying to hold them together and knit the dishcloth, my suggestion would be maybe go up to a US size, maybe nine, um, just give it a try. And then the other thing too, is if you do hold them together and you go to the larger needle, your heart is going to come out much larger, which might be great. Like, you know, a larger dishcloth is great. Um, but I mean, I guess this is getting slightly into the math, not too much. Um, the main thing is, is if you do something like that, where you hold the yarns together, and you've used a larger needle and it's coming out larger. You just wanna make sure that you're getting to an even number when you're doing that increase section so that when it comes time to split the heart, then you can easily split it into an even number to do the decreases. And so like, for example, with my swatches here, I mean, I went to 32 stitches instead of 40 and still would get the same heart shape. It's just, you know, these would come out a little smaller because I'm using this yarn. So that's the only thing to think of is if you hold them together and use the bigger needle, your heart's going to come out bigger. And if you don't want to come out bigger, then you're going to have to do a little thinking on the math side <laughs> um, to, to make the heart be smaller. But it's really not too much. It's really just dividing by two. And speaking of the scrubby yarn, Darla was wondering if you had any tips for knitting with a scrubby yarn. Yes. So this was my first time knitting with the scrubby yarn. I've always been intrigued by it, but had never actually tried it. Um, so my suggestion is that um, if you are finding that your stitches are coming out a little bit tight, you could try to go down a needle size because I found like you can't like, you know, you can't tighten your stitches. I mean, not that you want to be like cranking down on your knitting stitches on your knitting needle. Um, but you really don't have any wiggle room as far as tightening your stitches or loosening your stitches. So you might find it easier to be on a slightly smaller needle um, when you're knitting it. And then also, I don't have my metal needles near me, um, but you might find like this particular knitting needle, it is wood, but it's like really smooth. Like I almost feel like maybe it's coated with something. So I think finding like a really smooth wood needle um, opposed to one that maybe feels like almost like a little more grippy um, or using like an aluminum needle is what I used to knit my scrubby. That might help you as well because this yarn, um, it's great because if you make a mistake as you're knitting, I mean, it's so fuzzy. Like if I had made a mistake in here or had the wrong number of stitches, I mean, how are you ever going to know? Um, so that's a great advantage, but it's unforgiving in that there's no sort of give to the yarn. It's 100% polyester. So I would say either use a smaller needle or make sure your needle's like really smooth. All right. And still on the pattern, can mm -hmm. this particular bee pattern be done knit a row, purl a row? Absolutely. That's actually a really great suggestion. Yes. If you wanted to be purling the stitches on the wrong side, you absolutely could do that. 
Um, the only sort of disadvantage, and again, it's a dishcloth. You're just going to be washing your dishes with it probably, um, is that it might curl in. So when you're knitting on the right side and you're purling on the wrong, wrong side, that makes something called stockinette stitch. That's what we think of when we think of knitted fabric. Um, and if, if you don't have any sort of edging along a stockinette fabric, it has a tendency to kind of curl on itself. Um, we are slipping that first stitch. So that is going to help it some. Um, so it might end up curling a little bit. And then the final decrease row is on the wrong side. Um, and so, I mean, I don't know if you are going to want to slip, slip, purl or purl two together through the back loop or anything like that. Um, but you probably, again, it's a dishcloth. You probably could just, if you were purling on the wrong side, just use like purl two together decreases for that very top row for the top halves of each heart. And that would be totally fine. Again, you might want to add, like maybe do something where you're knitting one or two stitches at the beginning and then purling to the last two stitches and then knit knit two at the end just to sort of create a little bit of a border. But again, it's up to you. And that's that's this is a great project that you could really experiment. If you wanted to try to do this in seed stitch where you're kind of alternating knit one and purl one, it could be a little trickier because of the increases. But this is something where you definitely could play around with it and make it your own. All right, one last question that's specific to this pattern, and then we'll really zoom out for some general knitting questions right at the end of our event. Uh, Brenda is asking, why do you decrease differently at the beginning of the row, but knit two together at the end of the row? That's a really good question. I didn't, I guess, fully explain that one as I was doing it. So this is one of those things that it's a, it's a very minor little detail. Um, and maybe in a dishcloth, it, it's not like that noticeable, um, but something that you will come across in other, other knitting patterns where it will matter. So we did the slip slip knit at the beginning of the row because that makes a left leaning decrease. And so we wanted the top of our heart at the start to start leaning to the left. So the slip slip knit actually makes a decrease that leans to the left. Your, st your stitches lean to the left. And then at the end of the row, we did a knit two together and that's a right leaning decrease. And so it leans to the right. Um, again, when you're talking about a dishcloth, it probably doesn't matter. You could probably use a knit two together for both of them. Um, you know, very minor detail, but I, I do just cause I do like to design other things too. I do like it when, I'm using the decreases that lean the way I'm wanting my fabric to go. So that's why I chose to use those. All right, we're gonna zoom out a little bit. We have time for two more questions, I believe. Uh, and this first question comes in from Sharon. I'm learning a lot, that's exciting. I'm so glad to hear yeah. that. Uh, is it good to put a lifeline on the knitting? I've heard about that, but not sure what it is. And first I'm going to go ahead and say, we have some community interaction with this question, but I would like to see what Jen can share with us about this lifeline. Okay, yeah, lifeline's a great idea. I mean, for me personally, on a project like this, a small dishcloth, I probably wouldn't put a lifeline in just because if I messed up, I feel like I would just take my knitting out and fix it or start over. Um, but something if you're making a larger project and if you and if you want to use a lifeline for this, you absolutely can. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can either use, um, I would recommend using a different yarn that is smooth. Don't, don't use the scrubby yarn as your lifeline or don't use like mohair or something. You're gonna wanna use a, a thin yarn um, prefer, uh, that's smooth, preferably something thinner than what your project is. Um, and then you can load the yarn onto your little tapestry yarn needle and you're gonna run it under the stitches that are on your needle. Um, and then what I like to actually do when I do use a lifeline is you wanna make sure you have nice long tails hanging down. Sometimes I'll make the yarn tails really long and then tie them together so it's like a loop so like they can't fall off the lifeline. Um, and then you would keep working. Um, there are some circular needles. I don't know if, I don't know if it, this particular one has it. Um, it doesn't. But there's some circular needles that actually have a small little hole in them already. And you can um, run um, yarn right through those little holes or even use um, like uh, plain floss, like dental floss. Um, and then as you're knitting, it sort of puts your lifeline in at the same time. Um, I usually just use the tapestry needle, run it under your needle. So it's going through every single stitch. 
and then you have that available to you. You would keep knitting. And then if you make a mistake, you could pull your knit knitting needle fully out and start unraveling your knitting and your stitches can't go below where that lifeline is because all that, that lifeline or that other yarn you've used has passed through all of your stitches. Um, where I like to use this is if I'm like, especially doing like a complicated lace shawl or something that has lots of different stitches I'm doing. Um, and I'm worried that I'm gonna like lose my place or really mess up my lace pattern. I might put a lifeline in maybe every pattern repeat or something like that. I wouldn't recommend that you put a lifeline in like every two rows or something, because then you're just taking all your knitting time by putting in lifelines. Um, but of course, we do have a video for this on the knitting circle if you want to watch videos on um, how to put a lifeline in your knitting. All right, let's go to our, I would say, one of our most commonly asked questions in this event. And I want to finish with it so that Jen can send us all off with a little action item. So especially for those of you that are new-ish to knitting and are really excited about stocking your stuff. There are lots of questions, Jen, about where to get yarn, where to get a good price on yarn, any suggestions that you have for people that are starting to build their own inventory. This is the time. Let us know. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is there is so many places to get yarn. Um, when you are first starting out, I mean, I do recommend maybe going to a big box craft store, you know, like your Michaels, Joann's, what, whatever craft stores near you, um, even some larger um you know, larger regular stores will have, have yarn in them. Um, but yarn has really come a long way. Even the budget yarn that's at the craft stores, there's really nice yarn there for a very good price. Um, you can also go to your local yarn store. Um, if you look up online, there are whole stores that are small businesses that um, just sell yarn and needles and crochet hooks and the things you need to knit and crochet. Um, so it's really up to you. If you're starting with something like this where you're just gonna do some dishcloths or something, yeah, then maybe just go to the craft store. But you know, when it comes time when you start sort of exploring your um, knitting journey, um, you may find yourself wanting to go to a local yarn store to find really great yarns there. In general, not always, but in general, the yarn at a local yarn store is gonna be a little bit more expensive. Um, but a lot of it's hand dyed yarn by small indie dyers. Um, there's so much cool yarn to explore. I could talk about this all day. Um, but and then you can also, you know, you can find yarn online from anything from just a big online retailer to the craft stores sell the yarn online. But when you're just starting out, I mean, the way I started at well, I received some yarn as a gift. But when I was first learning to knit, I mean, I was going to the craft store and finding lots of good yarn there. And for a long time, that was the main place I was getting yarn. Um, and a lot of those craft stores do take coupons, so that's good too. <laughs> All right, before I finish up with a couple reminders, I would like to give Jen one more moment just to share with us any final thoughts that you have for this mini project, anything you want to leave us with before the event closes. Go for it. Yeah, I just, I really hope that you enjoyed watching me sort of going through some of the steps here today. And I really hope that you make yourself a dishcloth or two. Um, I mean, I knit like four or five of them just because I thought they were so cute. I couldn't stop. So I hope that, I hope that you enjoy knitting them as much as I do. And, um, you know, I, we'd love to have you post in the comments or whatever. If you do finish your, um, you do finish your dishcloth, come back and post a photo in the comments. We'd love to see it. This this is actually a fantastic segue. Thank you for mentioning mm -hmm. that, Jen. Uh, one of the things that I want to share with you before we go is that if you are making these projects this week and you would like to share your work with us, there's a hashtag that you can use on social media. It's very simple. You can hashtag share craftsy for a chance to be featured or just to have a hashtag to go click through and see what all of you out in the community are doing. If you're trying some of that experimentation that Jen mentioned and any of the projects that you're doing this week, Hashtag share craftsy is going to be a great place to accumulate all of those projects. So with that said, it is going to be time for me to send you off, but not without a few reminders. Remember, please join us again tomorrow for the love of crafting five Valentine's Day creations from the heart mini series. We will be streaming tomorrow live with our quilting instructor, Colleen Talkie, and we're starting at 2 p.m. Central Time. Colleen is going to be providing a live tutorial on how to make a quilt as you go backpack buddy. You can download the materials list and the free pattern right now using the link in the description before tomorrow's event. 
And you can also find our entire mini series schedule in the video description. So go ahead and check that out. As always, share your work as you're going, and we hope to see you tomorrow.